also uh, this Friday we have Piranha 3D coming out, the new movie from Alexandra Aja, yep. who uh, I think kind of started this whole French new wave of horror that we've been riding oh, on totally. since about 2003. Um, exactly he, 2003, in yeah. fact. <laughs> High Tension was kind of the first one of those, you know, extreme violent uh, French horror movies that were just making the American movies just look tame and laughable by comparison. <laughs> yeah, I mean, High Tension... I mean, I guess like if he, I think back of like the 2000s, it was really one of the. For the, I'll get more into this, but it, <laughs> I think the best one you have to give to uh, what's it called it. Um, the descent is probably oh, as the far best. as the descent yes. of the decade. Yes, so definitely. They, that's probably the best. But High Tension was probably up there. Though I will say, High Tension was a great film for like eighty-five minutes out of ninety minutes, and then that last yes. five minutes fucking ruined it. <laughs> we will uh, go into more detail. One thing we want to mention uh, is that uh, Alexandre Aja had a bunch of, you know, previous movies that he did in France. Yes. High Tension was the first one to be imported to U.S. theatrical release. Mm -hmm. uh, Lionsgate put it out. They're kind of like the unsung heroes of. Horror in the new millennium and they also put out saw in the descent it's it's much like sort of you know like we talk about with like edgar wright and stuff it started out small i mean it didn't make a ton of money theatrically it mm -hmm. made like maybe three and a half million dollars yeah um but it's sort of grown as a cult oh, film ever definitely. since then if you go on horror websites horror forums people love high tension yeah. uh for me i mean i guess now we can get into it watching the movie it's such a simple premise like a girl is at a friend's house and a crazy killer shows up starts killing the friend's family the friend nope. is kidnapped she has to save her friend that's it it's so simple and honestly after the first 15 minutes of the movie there's not dialogue in the movie pretty much it doesn't yeah. matter that it's a french movie if you don't like subtitles or if you're one of those weirdos. <laughs> um, and honestly, for the first 85 minutes of the movie, it is gory. It is suspenseful. I was sitting there watching it. I'm like, this is one of the best horror movies I've yeah. ever seen. I loved it yeah. for 85 minutes, like you said. And then there's a twist ending, which is the most unnecessary and stupid twist ending yeah. of all time. I'm going to throw it out there, just saying. And it <laughs> you know, kind of me. like negates a lot of the stuff that you've just oh, watched. totally. Whole sequences make no sense in light of the ending. The characters suddenly make no sense in light of the ending. And it, it's just too bad. <laughs> and it's it's weird. You wonder how that sort of came about. I don't know if, if he yeah. <laughs> actually had planned that all along or somebody sort of pressured him to do it. Or From what? what I hear, I watched some of the bonus features on the DVD. Uh, Luke Besson is a person yes, you know, famously involved, and he produced <laughs> High Tension. Uh, and I guess this the twist was in there, and he said, you know what? Run with it. Don't have it just be in the last minute. Have it be like a 10-minute sequence. And I mean, I would be pissed off enough if it was just at the end, but maybe you don't always listen to Luke Besson. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Luke Besson's pretty hit or miss. But for me, the thing is, you know, I talk about The Descent being the best horror film of the decade. Mm -hmm. High Tension for me was up there, really oh, high up there definitely. for a long time. <laughs> but that twist is so bad, it drops it <laughs> Without way a doubt. down that okay. list. <laughs> it t makes a great movie a pretty good movie. It's one of the only movies I've seen do that <laughs> to me with, with just a bad ending. And you know, you, it, I mean, it's it's there's clearly talent oh, in his filmmaking. Definitely, no like, question his about that. To build suspense, the makeup effects, the gore, the way he's able to shoot it. But just... you know, it's somewhere like M Night Shyamalan. Like he's got some talent, but without like somebody like <laughs> stepping in, being like, that's just dumb. But to be fair, I'm not gonna say the ending of High Tension is dumb as it is. It doesn't bring the movie to a level of the happening or anything like that. Well, the happening is terrible fair. all the way through. <laughs> right? I mean, you know, it's sort of, you'd have to talk about like the sixth sense or something. You know, where a twist ending and how mm -hmm. that sort of affects how you sort but of. But it's kind of the, the opposite film. of Shyamalan, actually, because for a lot of people, the twists made the movie. I would say with Sixth Sense, well, the twist made the I feel, movie. For I feel most I feel like it was only the one film. Like the other <laughs> ones, they tried to do a twist to make the film, and it didn't work. At all. To be fair, Unbreakable is a pretty sweet twist. I like the twist in Unbreakable. Uh, I mean, is it really that much That's of a twist? That's why they call me Mr. Glass. Like, I, kids, I, I don't feel know. like that was uh, that much of a twist. So, <laughs> I mean. But uh, So then moving on, High Tension brings him uh, a lot of international attention, so much so that his next movie is, unfortunately enough, a remake. He gets caught up in that bad American mentality of, oh, a horror movie. That's to be a remake of a classic or of a foreign film. Luckily, he wasn't doing an English version of High Tension, I guess. Yeah. But uh, he got Wes Craven to produce a remake of Craven's own Hills Have Eyes, yep. which uh, you know, modern remakes, as far as it goes compared to the others, it's one of the better ones. I don't think it's a great movie. I think it's okay, and it, I don't think it's better than the original. It's definitely better than the sequel they made to this <laughs> <Yeah>. one. <laughs> the Hills of Ice 2, the sequel To remake. the remake, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> the sequel to the remake that wasn't a remake of the original sequel. Yeah, so like, try and do that math in your head. <laughs> um, 
I mean, it was it was successful. It made mm -hmm. what, let's see, forty two million dollars on a sixteen million dollar budget. So clearly, yeah. the guy um, was able to bring audiences in. Mm -hmm. I think, and he showed some talent with it. For me, I think there was a little overuse of CGI in some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. A little bit of some showing off with some cinematography that I didn't like. But the tensions there, the the gore, like the brutality is there that's in all of his movies. Yeah. And there's actually still some interesting performances. Aaron Stanford is one of my favorite young actors. I first saw mm. him in Tadpole, then he was Pyro yeah. in X-Men 2. And he shows a lot of range in The Hills Have Eyes. He becomes the hero of that movie, going from like a nebbish guy to the badass who has to fight these evil mutants. Yeah, you know, uh, I really, I, I think it was a solid film, but unlike High Tension, it really didn't distinguish itself yeah. for me. It was mm -hmm. fairly sort of, um, I, won't, I bland doesn't seem like the right word, but it blended. It's sort of forgettable. It blended in with a lot of other stuff. Yeah, that, that was, was out at the time. Yeah. Um, and for me, just the big test of a remake is it comparable to sequel? This one, not at all. Just because the original had this great thing where not only was the family developed, but the mutant family was developed. You got this good contrast of like, you know, oh, the black sheep in the regular family is maybe someone who's doing something different, not going along the career path that the dad accepts of. But then the black sheep of the mutant family is the nice one the normal one um, and then at the end as those lines are blurred and the normal family becomes more brutal in this movie there's not really much of that especially with the mutant family they yeah. don't really get dialogue and they're kind of they're just monsters they're not people like they were in the original and that I think made the movie suffer and you know the thing is like I mean it's it's a, it's I mean there's no like twist that negate the entire yeah. plot before it. So <laughs> at that, least that, the stage that, consistent that's a positive, the way through yeah I mean but I mean it's it, it shows some talent to make a cohesive project but mm -hmm. it, i mean I, you wonder how much he was trapped with the remake and that sort of limited what he was able to do the thing that sort of struck me though is that then he goes on after that and he writes p2 which yeah. starred wes bentley and rachel nichols and it was like again you're like where's the decision making process guy like you did you you, you were pretty good with high tension but you did the end was bad hills have highs were pretty solid all the way through except that it was a remake, it was a remake yeah um and P2 was just like, where is your mindset, man? Like, <laughs> I honestly didn't watch P2. Everything I heard dumb. about it said it was awful, except for I have one friend who's really into modern horror movies who said he loved it. It's, so. it's dumb. <laughs> Wes Bentley is not that great of an actor. It seemed like an interesting premise, at least, which is, I think, maybe something Alexandria Aja, you know, the premise in High Tension was good, but then that ending negated it. The, like, you're trapped in a parking garage with a killer. That's that's interesting enough of an idea, maybe for a 10-minute short. Yeah, I, really, <laughs> that's why I would agree. It's more of like a short yeah. as opposed to a feature. And but we have to mention, he did not direct it. He was just producer writer. and writer. Yep. Um, his next directorial offering was, unfortunately, another remake. This one of a more obscure movie, and that was Mirrors with Kiefer Sutherland, is a remake of a Korean movie from a few years earlier. And this was the first movie where I'm like, okay, the ending of High Tension was bad. The rest of the movie was great. Mirrors is just bad the whole way yeah. through. I hated Mirrors. <laughs> Which, I mean, again, you know, like, there's some sequences that make you remember he has some talent, mm. but... It's so, like, shittily done. That yeah, like... the story just didn't make sense. It was a ghost movie. I have a lot of problems with ghost movies because they can't establish rules very well. Kind of anything can happen. And uh, that really happened with Mirrors and just bland performances. You know, I'm a fan of Keith or Sutherland from Lost Boys in 24, but he can be very bland. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I, was in that movie. I, I just, it was just a failure, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Yeah. But, that being said, you know, now he has Piranha 3D. Yep. Again, another fucking remake, man. Yeah, like, I know. Seriously. It that... really makes you wonder, like, be your own man. Don't just make a career of remakes. I know those are easy to get greenlit, but you've had some success. Hills Have Eyes well, made I double mean, its budget I mean, I mean, just about. You wonder if this is the only way he's able to get films made or... He's or just, maybe he honestly doesn't really care. He just wants to get whatever can be made now. Or maybe, maybe it'd be more of work to get something original made. Or maybe we're giving his his work on high tension too much credit, and he really <laughs> is kind of a hack filmmaker. <laughs> um, I don't know, because from what I've seen from Piranha, like yeah, you know, minus points for being a remake, minus points for being a remake of a good movie, minus points for being a remake of a Joe Dante movie, you know, but uh, and minus points for being Roger in 3D, Roman. but. Uh, I think the trailer looks fun, and there are interesting things about it. The fact that the cast is Elizabeth Shue as the lead character, Richard Dreyfuss and Christopher Lloyd in and supporting don't parts. For, don't forget Adam Scott. I mean, Adam, Adam Scott, Scott is coming like off the of Party lead. Down, yeah. man. That guy is a fantastic actor, mm -hmm. like very underappreciated. I think he was probably one of the best parts of Step Brothers for yeah, me. Yeah, like we mentioned a yeah, few weeks ago. I mean, ago, yeah. so he he's a guy who was very underappreciated, but he's in this. I mean, you got Jerry O'Connell. Mm -hmm. I like Jerry O'Connell generally. Yeah, Vin Rames. Some, you got some 
some sad people though, like uh, Dina Meyer from uh, <laughs> Starship Troopers. Oh, she really tends to be in some weak stuff, except yeah. for Starship. Troopers. Maybe this is her comeback. Who knows? Maybe <laughs> Richard Dreyfus and Christopher Lloyd. I think that's cool. I, th- I think I think there's a little bit of novelty and kitsch to it, but I feel kind of sad for them. That's really where I come down. Is that I don't know. I mean, I, I just don't feel like people are looking for Richard Dreyfus to be in movies anymore. Yeah, but I mean, to me, it's like more power to the person who puts Richard Dreyfus in the movie. More power to the person who has Elizabeth Shue be the lead instead of someone from the WB or UPN or whatever it is now. Here's here's another concern, though. Um, It has a small role for Eli Roth. Yeah, but see, the thing about this role for Eli Roth, as opposed to his role in Inglorious Bastards, which you that's know, like as we his one good role. As we mentioned previously, uh, I loved Inglorious Bastards. Thought Eli Roth was very bland, and they should have had a real actor do it. Um, that's his best role, with, though. Well, I would say Cabin Fever was his best role, where he played the drug uh, dealer. Yeah, that's I, true. That's true. See, and that is, pl- I think this part is going to play more to that. He's playing a spring break DJ, wet who, t-shirt, wait contest t-shirt contest MC. MC. Yeah. You know, he he's going to be playing a douchebag, and I think he you know, is, I I like that one. Oh, yes. I'd like Eli Roth's movies when he's behind the camera. The dude can play a good douchebag. You know, yes. read into that what you will. But I think this part will be something it's easy for Paul him to Shear. get into. Paul Shear's in it, too. Oh, hmm. So that's cool. So it is, it's an interesting cast. It looks like it's not going to have any pretensions. It's not going to be a serious movie, which actually, that's the first time for Aja because his other ones have been deathly serious yeah. movies. So I think it being kind of fun, being kind of kitschy, you know, it's about boobs and blood and beasts in 3D. Which we like. Yeah, we like it. Us and Joe Bob Briggs. Yeah. You know? So let us know what you think about Alexandria Aja. Are you excited about Piranha 3D? Uh, are we way off base with high tension? I know some people, you know, can sing us praises to high heaven, even the ending. Uh, MacGuffinPodcast.com is where you can let us know. Yes. Are we crazy? Is he the next big thing? <laughs> I don't know. We don't know. It's up to you to decide. Yeah. <laughs> can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Magneto can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. This type don't even try to buy the sound. Mr. Spock can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The board can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and it feels alright.